الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا أشرف الأنبياء المرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا المرسلين أشرف الأنبياء والعاليه وصحبه أجمعين وعما بعد فقال الله عز وجل في القرآن المجيد في سورة أغواض أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم سبق الله المعلم عزيز Alhamdulillah, dear respected brothers and sisters, I would like again to greet all of you in the tradition of Islam of Islam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanallah, there's a very popular phrase nowadays, and it's gaining more popularity probably for uh, not the best of reasons, but nonetheless, uh, we are seeing it probably in every news feed. Uh, we're seeing it in our social media, we're seeing it in CNN, we're seeing it in Fox, and we actually have something to do with it. <coughs> Muslims have a very, very particular role when it comes to this phrase, and the, the saying, make America great again. The slogan of one of the highly contested presidential candidates who was running for the president of this, this country. So make America great again is actually something that we take a large part in and a ro large role in and Islam has always had a leadership in that area which many people don't know about. And when you look at every civilization that had some greatness, that had something to offer, that contributed to the world, that contributed to society, when you look when they became great, their greatness actually started at the inception of that civilization. So the beginning uh, days of certain civilization, those men and those women who actually founded that union or who founded that state or who founded a ideology or a revolution, those were some of the greatest men. Those were some of the greatest figures that led to making a civilization great. And when we say, or when Donald Trump says, let's make America great again, well, we have to look, well, when was it great? How was it great? What gave it that stature that we see, that we as Muslims come here, and minorities and what have you, and call it home today? and our future generations will be calling it home. What made America so great? So you have to look in depth of who were the people who wrote the Declaration of Independence, who were the men who took part in debating the Constitution, who were the men and what influences they had when they wrote the Bill of Rights. You have to look in depth, and we look at Thomas Jefferson, when you look at John Adams, when you look at Benjamin Franklin, these are the men who are the founding fathers of this nation. When you look at them, you can't but help come across another name, John Locke. John Locke, Thomas Aquinas. These are thinkers and men who heavily influenced the founding fathers of this nation. That they were influenced so much so that what they received from John Locke, they embedded in the constitution of this country, and the Bill of Rights, and the freedoms that, and the liberties that we have and we hold so dear, these were all established under those people, under those men. Now you have to look at John Locke. Who influenced John Locke, a philosopher of the 17th century, a, a, a genius, a man with a vision, who spoke about the freedoms and spoke about these realities. Who inspired him? Who influenced the influencer of the founding fathers? When you go into detail of him, what names will you come across? You'll come across the names of Ibn Rushd, Ibn Sina, Ibn Tufail, Al-Ghazali, Al-Biruni. These are the men who influenced them. The books that they read were Muslim books. The books that John Locke read 
women, he began to come across the vision of freedom and liberty were the books of Muslim men that he wrote, that he read. Hukuk al-Huryat. Hukuk al-Qul. These are books written by Muslims. The rights of speech. Freedoms of speech. Huryat, the, uh, the rights of freedom. The rights of liberty. Where do you see this? You see it embedded in the fabric of the constitution of this country. Why? Because they were influenced by Muslims. And who were these men? Outside of being philosophers, outside of writing Qanun al-Fitib, which Ibn Sina uh, wrote, and it's still, I have friends who are in a medical school who still get uh, uh, manuscripts of Qanun al-Fitib taught in uh, a medical school till this day. And it was actually the number one academic uh, manuscript or document that all medical students read in, in Europe in the 17th centuries. Who was it written by? Who were the men who were known as the fathers of modern day medicine? Who were the men that are the fathers of algorithm and what we hold so dear today and, and the apps that direct us from one way to another way and the apps that have made billions of dollars in this, in this area alone? Who were the founders of these? They were, they were Muslim men. And they weren't just thinkers. They weren't just philosophers. They weren't just people who basically followed the academia way of sciences. They were ulama of this deen. They were ulama of this deen. They were the students of Medina. They were the students of Rasulullah These were the men. Before, it was saying that when Ibn Sina would come across a, a problem that when he would look at Aristotle or uh, 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 Galileo's uh, 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 reasoning or theory about something, and when he used to get puzzled, they say he used to go and make ablution, he used to go make wudu, and he would do a sikhara to see what uh, Allah will give him so he could have a better understanding of what Galileo and Aristotle said. These are men who held dear, they knew that the sciences also came from a source. That man did not make the laws have been described to us by men. But man did not give those laws. Those laws came from the same source. Those laws came from that one source and they went back to that source. These are the people who in turn influenced the, locks, uh, the, the likes of John Locke and Thomas Aquinas. And who did they influence again? The founding fathers of this nation. 11 years before the Declaration of Independence was written. A document that every American holds dear. The document that Muslims should hold dear. This truth, their evidence that all men are created equal. The source of it is an Islamic source. Thomas Jefferson, 11 years before he wrote the Declaration of Independence, guess what he bought? Guess what he added to his library 11 years before? A copy of the Quran. The same Quran that's sitting 250 years later in the Library of Congress, the same Quran that Keith Ellison swore on, and every other prominent congressman and inshallah future senator and maybe a future president might swear in inshallah. That's the Quran that Thomas Jefferson bought 11 years before he wrote the uh, <coughs> Declaration of Independence of this country. And Thomas Jefferson, speak with historians. Read what historians have written about Thomas Jefferson. He wasn't a man that you just go pick up a, a book and le read it for leisure. He was a man that when he would read a book, he would go between the lines. He would study it. <clears throat> he would allow it to be absorbed in every single cell that, was, that made his vision. And who were these men? These men were the founding fathers of this nation. When he was campaigning in Virginia, he's a, what, our third president, the third president of this country? When he was campaigning in Virginia, he looked at the people and he said, you know, the respect that I have for Islam and what I know about Muslims, every Muslim is welcomed in this country. Every Muslim, this is not Abu Bakr saying it, I'm not saying this. Thomas Jefferson is saying this. 
the man who authored the Declaration of Independence. And when you look at other people, Benjamin Franklin. You know what Benjamin Franklin was known as? Do you know who, what his title was? Because of his patriotism? Because he was a founder of this nation? Because he adored this nation, this country? He was known as the first American. That's, that's, that's the lakab, that's the title, the nickname given to uh, Benjamin Franklin. The first American, meaning he was a patriot. And what does this patriot say about Islam and Muslims? There was a group of frontiersmen, white American frontiersmen, that they came across a group of free men, free men, free Indians, Native Americans. <clears throat> he comes across them. They come across them. And these frontiersmen attack and imprison some of them, and then they brutally and heinously kill every single one of these Native Americans, including their children. <clears throat> heinously killed in a very barbaric fashion. News reaches a Benjamin Franklin. He's in uh, uh, Pennsylvania, where the DNC convention took place. News reaches Benjamin Franklin. And you know what Benjamin Franklin said? He said, these Indians, these Native American Indians who are free men under the law, that these free men would have been better off in a Muslim country, under a Muslim rule. What is the Muslim rule? Sharia. Under the rule of Rasulullah they would have been better off. Why? He said, because they were free men. When prisoners used to be in the hands of Sahaba, in the hands of the companion of Rasulullah under the hands of Rasulullah, they were safeguarded. Their lives were safeguarded. They were fed. They were clothed. They were given shelter. That if these men were in the hands of Muslims, they were better off than being in the hands of Americans. This is what Benjamin Franklin said. This is what he said. This is the teaching of Islam, he said. He talked about the 12th century uh, Muslim warrior, Salahuddin Ayyubi. He said he is one of the greatest men. Why? And look at what he says. Why? Because he followed Rasulullah Sallallahu closely. He said as much as he was just, as much as he was firm in justice, and as much as he was firm in, uh, uh, in law and governance, he was a compassionate man. He was a man of mercy. He was a man of love. That even when prisoners used to be in the, in the realm of Salahuddin al-Ayubi, they felt safeguarded. He said that I praise him. This is what Benjamin Franklin is saying about a Muslim. And now I want to ask you guys this. And I want to ask, and I want you to ask yourselves this. And I want you to ask your fellow Americans this. Your neighbors this. Who is more patriotic? Who is more patriotic? Benjamin Franklin, the first American, the founding father of this nation, or Donald Trump, or Newt Gingrich, or Bill O'Reilly. Who's more patriotic? Who is more patriotic than those men who welcomed us in this country? Who put a welcoming mat before Muslims, and Muslims were the first people to recognize this country was Morocco. The first country, everybody else was scared of the crown was scared of Great Britain to recognize America. Who had the audacity? Who had the courage to, to, to recognize a country? Why? Because they were fighting for their religious freedom. Because they were fighting for their liberties. They were fighting and they were steadfast to gain the, the rights that God had given them. Their human rights. And the first country to recognize that was a Muslim country, was Morocco. This is the history of Islam in America. We have a history here. Not just 60 years ago or 50 years ago or when uh, 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 the Isna was founded or Ikna was founded. No, way before that. Way before that. And probably even way before the founding fathers, Islam had uh, a, 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 a presence in this country. And Islam still has a presence in this country. This is what? Islam offered this nation. This is what the founding fathers, George Washington, 
he, he lived in Mount Vernon. He said that, I welcome every Muhammadan. At that time, they, they called Muslims Muhammadans or Muhammadan, as how they called them. <coughs> I work, welcome every Muhammadan in Mount Vernon. This is George Washington, the first president of this country. This is the welcoming mat the founding fathers of this nation have left for us. The reflection of Donald Trump is not the reflection of America. What's happening is he is bamboozling people. He is trying to bring uh, confusion amongst people. And you know one of the reasons that the confusion is? Because we've been sitting in the shadows for too long. We've been here, we've been too busy with the paychecks and paying our mortgages and paying our car payments and this and that. And we've allowed this to happen. We've allowed this from happening from 250 years ago. A time where these people were barely exposed to people. The nation was barely, the founding fathers knew about Islam, but the nation was not exposed to Muslims. Today in every corner there's Muslims, mashallah. But, what do we need to do? We need to allow them to know what our deen truly is. What the sunnah of Rasulullah is. When Newt Gingrich says, I'm going to do a test on every Muslim, that if they follow Sharia, they will be deported. Does he know what Sharia is? Does he know the essence of Sharia? The kaifi of Sharia? If Sharia was truly implemented, every life of every American would be safe. The life of every European would be safe. The life of every animal would be safe if Sharia was implemented. That's Sharia. They are trying to make a, a monster out of Sharia. But what is Sharia in reality? Sharia is the essence of what Rasulullah taught us. It's what the companions taught us. Ati bi sunnati min bab. Quran says, Atiu Allah wa Atiu Rasulullah wa Minkum. This is how it came about that from Allah to Rasulullah and to the Sahaba and the companions, that today we have this amana, a trust, which is Sharia. What was Sharia? What was the implementation of Sharia that it, 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 it safeguarded an animal during the time of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala? A dog, a dog died because of hunger, because of malnutrition in one of the Muslim rural areas. Word came to Sayyidina Umar. And the dog died. He brought every single person from that town. And he said, every single one of you are charged with the blood money of that dog. That you guys must, and they said, why? They said, well, you saw this dog walking around your neighborhood. And he was weak and he was starving, and none of you gave him food and water. This is not Islam. Islam even takes care, let, forget about your neighbors and uh, uh, other human beings, but even the, the, a dog and an animal's life is held dearly in Islam and is precious in Islam. This is what Sharia teaches us. When they say about Sharia, they have no clue what Sharia is. They have no clue what the essence of Sharia is. And some of those people under the false flags of Islam that are declaring Sharia, they don't know what Sharia is. They have no clue what Sharia is either. What do we need to know? We need to understand the true realities of our deen. What was the true message of Rasulullah The message of compassion, the message of love. When he had Quraysh in front of him, after the Fatah of Mecca, after conquering Mecca, Every single one. Who were these people? You have to look at this. These were the people that tore the chest of his beloved uncle, Hamza, and took his heart out. These were the people who were in front of him, the, the persons who killed Sahaba, who killed their parents. And what did he say? He looked at them. He said, what do you think I'm going to do? And you know what they said? Even his enemies knew who he was. He said, you're Kareem, you're Ibn Kareem. All we've seen is Karamat from you. Do what you want to do, because we know who you are. We know who this judge is. We know who this man is. And we believe in the 
even their kafir, they fought against them. They shed blood against them. But they still know who this man is, that only the scent of love, only the scent of compassion comes from Rasulullah. And they knew that. They felt that in their bodies. And you know what he said? From this day on forward, nothing shall happen to you. He forgave every single one of them. This is what your deen teaches. This is what we need to teach to our youngsters, to our children, to our neighbors. Invite your Christian and Jewish neighbors to your home. Let them know what your faith is. Let them know what the Abrahamic tradition is. Let them know what Rasulullah teaches us, what the Sahaba taught us. Let them know that Abu Bakr Baghdadi is not our teacher. Let them know that ISIS does not represent us. Let them know that who Omar was, who Abu, the real Abu Bakr was, who Osman was, who Ali was. Those are the men that we need to follow. Those are our leaders. And those are the people who have a right on us today. And this very day that we look back to and we follow their paths. Due to time, I will, won't be able to continue the uh, lecture any longer, inshallah. But when you go home, take this with you. One thing that's happening with us is we sit in Jummah and say, mashallah, this and that, and alhamdulillah. And then right when we walk out of that car, you know, uh, back to the same old thing. We need, to, we need to really take this home with us. We really need to take it to our workplaces. We really need to take it to the bazaars, to the places, to our businesses. To how we interact with people, how we smile at people. How when you walk past by some in the grocery store, you smile and say hello. How are you? Salam, whatever. And then tell them what salam means. Salam alaikum means. We need to engage ourselves in society. Verily, Allah will not change the condition of the people who we all know this. And so, we change the condition of ourselves. ومن سيات عملنا من يحيي له فلا مضر الله ومن يدد فلا حاجة له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله كذلك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله جميعا أنبياء المسلمين خصوصا على الصحابة بالتوفيق أمين المؤمنين سيدنا أبو بكر الصديق رضي الله عنه والعمين